organisation that we're setting up and establishing um, around evidence broking. And that's a, a quite a technical term. So how I wanted to get into the discussion today, um, one is to treat it as a discussion, because as part of, as you'll hear, the work of evidence broking is actually about creating some dialogue and some, some conversations. Um, and we're hoping to share some learnings with you about how that journey is going and seeing whether it's useful for you. Um, as I kick off, though, can I just check? Um, just hands up if you're a practicing educator at the moment, a teacher or a school leader. Great. And others are in policy work or... Okay, great. So, um, always with these presentations and conversations, what I hope to do is generate a couple of ideas or some items that might be some new knowledge. So one of the bits that I've really gotten some great benefit from in any of these presentations and talking about work is, is beginning with a starting with why principle um, from a, a guy called Simon Sinek, um, which is a lovely model of before you jump into talking about any of the things that you desperately want to describe, which is the outer barrier of the what, you need to step back and begin with a place about what's the motivation behind the work. Then you can more authentically answer, well, how would you go about doing that? What you've given your primary drivers. And then finally, where what does that look like in practice? How does that express itself in, in the world and in your work? So the why for this evidence broking that I'm about to talk to you about uh, and making research knowledge more available just begins with children and young people and their experience in schools. So our why is about making, giving these and all the other learners in schools around Australia the best possible opportunity to get the greatest value out of the education that they receive. Um, so that's a great moral purpose to be getting up and working for every day. And like all educators in Australia and around the world, that is the core activity. We begin by saying, how can we help give our learners the greatest possible opportunity for, for progressing? Um, it, it gets a little stronger than that for the work that we're doing as an evidence broker, though, because we know that there are many students for whom um, education is difficult, formal schooling education, um, is less than effective, um, causes them problems, can often even do damage in terms of their own self-perception or their, their future life chances. So our aim, if we sort of focus a bit deeper on this why, for us, is about heading into saying, how can we make sure that learning is as effective as it can be for all of the learners that are in our care? Um, that why gets even a little sharper for us in the work in Australia um, because of the statistics that talk, tell us about the range of people who miss out or who miss out on good experiences. So this is a, a diagram from a study done by the Mitchell Institute looking at educational opportunity in Australia. And it's, uh, it's like a game of snakes and ladders, if you know that board game. If you're in the green at each of these life stages as they move down from early years through to school, um, senior school years and, and ultimately early adulthood, those on the green are at about where you would hope in the range of a milestone of progress. Those in the red are behind. Now, there are some ladders in Australia, which is terrific, which represents those arrows moving from the red zones into the green. So at each stage, we can see we've got you know, 22 or 25% of people who are actually missing out and at risk of further missing out and receiving and, and heading into disadvantage. So, at each stage, our systems can do a good job of moving some of that population and those cohorts back on track. Um, but equally, we look at the green, and these are the snakes, we find either people continuing to stay in the red zone, permanently disadvantaged in terms of their life chances, or those that were sitting in a green space but moving across um, over into a, in, into a risk zone. So the work that I'm going to talk to you about for us is about trying to understand better both the causes of those changes and the ways in which we can try and help more people um, on the ladders as opposed to the snakes and moving into green zones of um, you know, ultimate, the best possible progress or better than, than the current status quo. Again, another picture of that why is that this is not easy work um, in understanding. These two um, pictures show us the spread of a... Uh, inside a typical year four class or a typical year eight class, the um, level of, uh, of academic um, gain or position, not gain, but rather the achievement level that they're at, their capability level. 
So inside a typical year four class, you've got a spread now of across six years potentially for kids to be responding to it. And practicing educators know this to be true and the data is continuing to, to support this story. And you look at a typical year eight class, you know, you've got a set of students sitting at um, end of year one level right up to end of year eight level capabilities. So it's very difficult for practicing educators to um, cater to all of that um, inside a single class, inside a year level curriculum, that spread of, uh, of achievement level for, for learners. Um, but we really ought to if we're going to come back to that picture of understanding how to respond to individual need. Finally, this graph which drives some of our conversation in the why um, plots our performance as a country on PISA um, from 2000 to 2015, um, which as we can see is you know, had a static and then now declining result on international uh, rankings compared to the amount that we've been investing in education. So we have in Australia made um, gains and you know, for those of us that kind of follow the current media there's been lots and lots of debate about the amount that we're spending and whether we should spend more or not. Um, but it is the case that we have been spending more than we have in the past and yet our performance on inter uh, international rankings and that's just on our these are on just static figures too, so not on comparative or relative terms, just against our own previous performance um, has been doing that poorly. So these are some of the challenges that really drive a conversation about, and you know, you're here at Research Head um, or at the ACE conference about this because you're interested in saying, well, what can we learn from the research evidence to help drive better choices? And so we're very interested in that question about how can we work to make sure uh, we're making the best possible choices and the best investments to get the best learning outcomes. Um, and that's actually not a well-settled debate. Um, as many of you would know, well, despite having very good evidence about many things, we find those things not move into practice. Or on the other side, we find that despite lots of um, well-practiced uh, activities, they're not researched or un understood properly in order to give people greater confidence that they should be doing them. So we kind of now move in that why, how and what into the how. So we as an evidence broker are trying to fix some inefficiency that runs between what practitioners know and work with and what research and evidence is, is doing and engaged in. So we're trying to make education better by learning and then sharing that learning. Um, so the diagram here is showing two processes that we say or feel like exist in an evidence ecosystem. On the left hand side, so on the right hand side as you see it here, there's a cycle in schools that we think can be stronger uh, in terms of the way in which change and improvement is being measured and evaluated and, and understood in schools. And then over here on the left hand side there's a role that the rest of us have got to play in trying to make that knowledge better understood. But at the heart of the work is actually teachers and school leaders. So the role of everybody else is actually just to help teachers and school leaders be even more effective in creating the right conditions inside the school for that work. And it's what we're learning is it's these uh, arrows between the two activities, what goes on in schools and the top arrows should be driving research questions far more than they do. So that knowledge and um, evidence that is created in schools is often not brought to the research community for them to investigate how could we help with a problem in practice that you're experiencing. So we regularly you know, understand schools to say, well, we're trying to make things better or we've gathered really excellent evidence about what we're doing, but no one wants to take it up. It can't move any further than beyond my school. Or the research that is done is only done to further the interests of the academic on an even more and more narrow topic rather than helping us with the thing we're most interested in solving. So for us as an evidence broker, that's one part of our role is to try and take the practice knowledge and cause the research to be conducted to help understand that practice experience better. The other side of the work that we see, the sort of arrow down the bottom, is that often there is excellent knowledge that's held um, in research, but it's not shared back in ways that are practical or useful for busy professionals. So, you know, uh, any, any busy um, 
professionals will know that kind of exploding inbox of research articles I've just got to get to. Um, but to, in order for that to become useful, you'd have to spend the time looking at it and get your head into right now, I've got to read it like an academic journal and then try and take away what's relevant for me in my day-to-day -day work. And as people get busier and busier, it's very difficult to do. So there's an obligation, we say, as a broker or for all of us to try and lift bridging that gap between research knowledge and into to practice value. So that's, that's a lot of what drives the, the work and the thinking that we're doing. Come back to some of those in a moment. Um, so how we think about operating to bridge those divides is uh, the you know, true idea as a broker. And like in other areas of life, brokers can be useful for busy people um, who want the best knowledge but don't have the time um, or expertise to hunt it down. And so hopefully we're a bit better than the mortgage brokers that you hear about or the car lease brokers because the way in which we're operating is with a very narrow purpose and as a non-profit mode, which I'll talk to you about in a moment. But in a little bit of our investigation, um, we see it as doing three things. One is distilling and communicating research knowledge, talking in plain English to busy people and bringing the knowledge in a form that is totally relevant to what they're working on right now. Um, the next is to try and create new forms of partnership between researchers, policy makers and practitioners um, that, that don't privilege one over the other or don't create a conversation that one feels like it's, it's coming um, with its head bowed and, and hoping to be um, told the answer but to actually work collaboratively. And then the third is about supporting practitioners to engage with their own evidence and, and test the local impact and in turn share that back around. So we've got some great experiences in now understanding how those flows work and how you need to hold yourself to get the right conversations moving so that we can get those good flows between the two arrows that we're talking about. Um, we're lucky in this work in that the idea of an evidence broker is not brand new. It actually has um, exists in a couple of other um, social policy areas and it has done for the last um, couple of decades. It's most advanced in healthcare. So healthcare and medicine has sort of driven itself as an evidence profession, evidence-based profession for 100 years or so. Um, it's worth remembering that it wasn't always so. Just in medicine and healthcare, it used to be the case that professionals um, would have their own body of knowledge that they would protect and store for themselves. There was vigorous arguments about whether randomised control trials were even ethical in healthcare a hundred years ago. Busy doctors would say, I've got a view that I've built up over the life of my practice that I know how to treat my patient and that's all I'm going to use or maybe I'll talk to a couple of other doctors but I'm not interested in what the research has got to tell me. Now we find that strange to understand in medicine terms now because they're so used to talking about using evidence to base their decisions on. Um, but it was the case in healthcare. But what they've found in healthcare was that actually a whole lot of research knowledge and um, common understandings about the evidence of things like how to treat patients immediately after a car accident or what to do um, in cases of uh, particular areas of need in, in the medical field still didn't move into changing practice. It wasn't enough. Knowing was not enough. Even having the best quality evidence and the, the argument being settled, which it rarely is in something like education, but in medicine they could say, well, look, we're very clear now the evidence tells us this. Practice still wasn't changing. And that's because, as brokers have had to respond to, to this need, there are many barriers to changing practice. It's not just enough to know. People need to have a sense that the person that's telling them about this information um, has only one agenda or doesn't have an agenda that's contrary to their own agenda. So um, that the, the ways in which you're being told to make those changes are in forms that you can do something about. It's a bit like the climate change stuff. We all know that things will happen, but no one's giving me a way of responding in a form that I can actually do. Um, and there's a few other bits in that work as well. So healthcare in the last 30, 20 years or so has been emerging this idea of we need people to move the knowledge from one place into practice. And now there's quite a lot of emerging literature and evidence about how you do that. And as I said, some of the bits of that are what I've been talking about already, that, that it's not enough to know, that 
brokers can be really useful, or boundary riders, or innovation leads, there's lots of different terms for the work, but can be quite useful in helping practice understand research, and particularly research to get closer and better to connect with practice, that dual relationship. Um, and I like, I sort of joke with my team that we um, live um, at Albury Wodonga, like on the boundary between two states and territories. We're not in either of those places, we're not practitioners, the team that are around me, we, some of us have had experience working in schools and, uh, and, and teaching in the classroom, but no longer doing that as a role. But neither are we researchers. We're actually something different. We have a, an appreciation of the needs of both, but feel like there is a third space that's important to occupy. And some of those um, activities that we're about have got those sort of big boxes that are up here on this slide. And they're quite different. Some of the, the um, skill sets we're drawing on come from communications and marketing companies, um, which is really weird for me to be working with advertisers, but they know a lot about how do you create the space for a conversation to happen. Social facilitators are others, so those that have come from psych or social science backgrounds and behavioural scientists are often into this frame as well. And a lot of it, as we're experiencing, is, is, is really about social relations, creating good positive spaces where the professionalism and the goodwill of the people who are engaged are, are um, established and almost always validated very quickly and then say, well, what can we learn from each other? How can we do that learning? So that's the how we're doing things. What that means um, and what I think hopefully is the most interesting part for all of you is, well, all right, if a broker is getting developed here in Australia, what, what does it do and what's in it for me? So, evidence for learning is the um, non-profit enterprise that's being created to do this work here in Australia. We've got a philanthropic grant from the Commonwealth Bank to present at events like this, work with networks of schools, engage with universities and try and promote this conversation so that high quality research knowledge can move and be used by schools and that the research community gets closer towards um, embracing the practice knowledge that does exist as well. Uh, so we're doing things nationally um, and the resources that I'm going to talk to you about are all free and open access and they'll always stay that way. The intention is to push this in as an honest broker um, that has no role in schooling and, and therefore we hope can be seen as someone that comes to the, the evidence with no other agenda. Um, we'll have statements about the things but they'll be based on what we can understand from the research evidence rather than it being suiting a particular government or a state or federal position. So our way of getting back to that why, and this for us is the theory of change in our own work, is that we say that if there were two conditions that were well attended to in Australia, one, that we increased our investment in high quality evidence, and that's both listening to practitioners as well as making research knowledge of high quality more widely available, uh, and we improve the conditions that school leaders, and I don't just mean principals and APs there, but heads of department, um, subject level coordinators and uh, year level coordinators and the like, um, engage with evidence, then they're more likely to create conditions in the school that better approaches are going to be more frequently adopted and lower impact approaches will be more quickly retired. And if we do that, then as a whole country, we're going to see greater improvement in the education performance. So turn those sort of lines on international rankings um, in, in a more positive direction. Higher impact approaches for the spending that we've got. So that's how we conceive of the work. Um, and we talk about doing that through building, sharing and using evidence together nationally. Um, and in each of those areas, I'm just going to talk to you quickly about some of the things that we're doing as a broker in that work. Uh, and, and hopefully make it, how would this be valuable to, to a practitioner in, in schools. So the first bit in terms of building evidence is using some of the Commonwealth Bank's money, we've created a thing called the Learning Impact Fund. And we're funding trials in schools of programs that are of interest to um, education departments or we hope school leaders. And we're doing trials of a very particular type. So we're funding randomised control trials. So these are trials where we're measuring the academic results of a program in schools and we're comparing those results 
to schools that are statistically similar that were recruited in the trial um, and they didn't know whether they were going to get the program or a different program, a comparable but different program on day one of the trial. And then we'll measure the effects at the end of two years trial and say, well, did we see an increase in academic performance as a result of those projects? So randomized control trials are the sort of what they talk about as gold standard in, um, in medicine. Um, we uh, are then starting to try, and we're not saying it's the only kind of evidence that should be generated in education, but we think it's particularly good as a broker to fund a bit more of that empirical data on academic performance measured by a program. Um, and we've already commissioned three trials like that, one related to maths instruction in primary schools, trying to build um, maths automaticity, so a bit addressing the cognitive load theory that's around. Another one relating to professional development of teachers in teaching maths, so trying to build their maths confidence and helping students, uh, helping their own students understand their own maths activities. And the third one in relation to phonics instruction for early years readers, which is particularly a um, live topic here in Australia for early literacy problems as well. So we think that funding those as an independent broker can give everybody a sense of us as a genuine inquirer into that question rather than either the program developer themselves saying we've done a trial and everybody thought our program was terrific um, because there's always a question about bias inside that or departments funding it and people would then have a view that well you would say that because that was the result you wanted from that. So we think it's a great opportunity for someone to stand and say we're going to fund these trials, we're going to conduct them rigorously and most importantly we're going to report. No matter the results we're going to put a, the report out and the report isn't going to go first in an academic journal that you have to pay money to get to we will publish for free on our website the results of those three programs. And that default for us is very important. We will continue to create new knowledge that we create, we'll make available in plain English um, and in forms that can help practitioners answer the question about, well, Quick Smart Maths was the name of one of the, the maths programs. Do I think Quick Smart Maths is going to be good for my school? Well, I can go to a source that I trust that's done a trial and they can give me some answers about that that let me make a better decision. Or on Minilit, which is the literacy intervention program that we're part of as well. So our aim here is that brokers move knowledge, higher quality knowledge more quickly. The graph there is showing really for us the question that we want to play in is in this space between innovating and scaling. Um, it's frightening really that what often happens in big system investments is they hear about a great innovation that occurs in a school, in five or six schools, uh, they say this is terrific, this should be everywhere. And you just sort of hold your breath and say, well maybe it shouldn't be everywhere. Maybe it should only be in schools that have got this level of leadership. Or maybe it should only be in schools where you've got these conditions in place. So we think it's far more important, it may it, maybe it should go everywhere, but let's test that. So we have a model that, um, we use for different levels of trial at different stages of scale to try and get some better, stronger answers to that question in order to help improve the investments that systems can make. Um, so already up on our website, um, Evidence for Learning, you'll see the details of those trials. You can look and see where they're tracking as well. So part of what we want to do is um, grow the conversation in Australia about um, randomised control trials and empirical measurement in education. And, um, you know, it's not all smooth sailing, but we're sharing that knowledge on the way through. So we're, again, trying to be very transparent about how that works. The other thing we have is called the Teaching and Learning Toolkit. So this is a shared open resource um, available on our website, which maps the global evidence on 34 approaches. And again, this is about trying to make the research knowledge that does exist very available very accessible and informed that a busy school leader or a teacher or even a parent can access to ask themselves questions or to help them answer questions as they consider what approach to use next. Um, so it has those 34 approaches with a dashboard at the top that um, rates the activity on the month's worth of impact, which is a translation of effect size for those of you that might be used to that language from research. Um, the, how confident we are about the research, so how many trials of a high quality sit underneath the evidence base, and then the dollar amount, how much does it cost to implement. Um, and that work is always being refreshed and updated. So 
inside the partnership that we have with our international partners, um, every six months there's another review of the academic literature and those numbers move. So the, the um, average month's worth of learning has moved in three um, approaches in the last round of refresh. And the lots always go up because we get better and better knowledge about those questions. Behind each of these is then a plain English summary of about 500 words describing what the um, approach is about, how confident we can be on the evidence that exists and how effective is it. And often underneath, these are averages, so a bit like you will have heard in other research conversations, an average can hide a really wide variation. So the last thing we would say is that people should just pick the number at the top and say, well, we're going to do this in our school. You should interrogate and engage with the information, but it's in a form that's really available and, and very readable and useful. So we'll tell you how wide the variation's been on the activity, um, where have been some good indicators of success, and most importantly, things to consider as a school leader, what you should, what you should think about doing next. We've also made that toolkit in forms that can work for um, different school systems. So on the left, on the right hand side of there, it's mapped to the Victorian department's model of the framework for improving student outcomes, or FISO, for Melbourne-based people. And on the left hand side, it's mapped to the New South Wales Schools Excellence Framework. So we're trying very hard to not just have another website that becomes difficult to get to, and oh, maybe I'll get there when I, when I think about it, to mapping this work exactly to um, the context that a school leader works in or that, that teachers are operating in. So as they're writing an annual plan or an annual improvement plan, plan where they have to write about work in these areas, they can use the toolkit to support that conversation. We've also mapped this to about uh, eight or nine other frameworks that are up on the website now, including um, ACER's school improvement tool um, and a number of other partners. So go and have a look there, you might find there's already an improvement um, paradigm that's being used that is in, in play in your school and this toolkit can then be directly relevant to the work that you're doing. I'm going to move just now and talk to you a little bit about the final part of the work which is using evidence. What are some of the ways in which we're trying to help schools work and engage and use evidence? So this is a cycle that was back up in that picture about what might happen in a school. And I thought I'd use this as a way of talking to you about um, what we know so far as I've used evidence growth and things you might think about um, as school leaders through that process. So around the process begins with a form of diagnosis or what's your impetus for change, understanding your local conditions. Awareness is about looking to the networks um, and information sources to help inform you about what you might do to make uh, an improvement to address that challenge in your school. Um, adopting and adapting uh, is, is about ultimately selecting an approach that you think is going to be right to help you in your challenge and then the, the orange circles are about implementing and evaluating and adjusting and then finally that play and crawl is about whether you're going to keep it going or retire it in your school. In a minute I'll talk to you about some ways of thinking about the evidence base and what we've learned work. Just quickly within that though, one of the things that we've also started to engage with is trying to make the resources more, uh, even more useful and relevant. So back up on the toolkit, feedback is a practice that has been shown by a lot of evidence to be very effective, plus eight months worth of um, learning in the teaching and learning toolkits and that's um, absolutely re repeated in John Hattie's meta-analysis in um, visible learning as well um, in a different form. But many people say, well, that's fine. Oh, we know feedback's really effective, but, but what does that mean? How do I do it effectively in my school? And so together with ATSL, we've created a set of resources that try and move from the what towards the how. Um, and so these are a, a summary of the research evidence, but not just to tell you more about the active ingredients, but to say, well, what do we think that looks like in practice? What would you actually do to build um, some items around building a whole school approach, trialling practices, explicit teaching and feedback, and building next steps in learning. So again, free resources that are available on ATSL's website, which have even got downloadable um, PowerPoint presentations for a conversation in your staff room. Um, a project planning tool to say, well, if you're on a feedback journey, how might you think about the conditions all the way through to 
give it the best chance of success in your school. So really trying to move beyond this, oh, look, the research says it, um, oh, we're doing it, but our practice looks nothing like what the research says is effective. We're trying to get some greater practice in, in play. I hope that makes sense. Um, the last bit of work that we're doing is in advocacy also uh, at a system level. So these are some graphs, uh, sorry, some, di uh, some infographics that are coming out from the Productivity Commission who have been conducting um, an inquiry into how do we build a better evidence base in education to help improve outcomes. So very much on the frame that we're talking about. And we've been very active in talking to them uh, about not thinking about this work as just top down, the research happens over here, schools get told you should now do practice A, B and C. And a lot of what we've been saying is because that will be a waste of investment, a waste of investment, unless you're engaging with professionals as they're working through the change in their school and bringing evidence to them, um, you, you'll make no change at all. So much like I was saying at the top of the presentation, we absolutely believe that where change occurs is in the classroom with teachers and kids in their learning. So unless the evidence is coming and helping those people be more effective, then it's irrelevant. So we'll see whether that, and we're making that argument now then into the Gonski 2 review, which is the sort of next piece of um, uh, policy review at a federal level uh, and we're very strongly going to be talking about the need to make sure that this um, concept of giving voice to busy professionals and making sure the evidence is structured in forms that are useful to busy professionals is the main game. Um, if we're just focusing on the, the what of a practice or the what of a research but not the how of making that work in schools then um, we'll have missed a trick and we'll absolutely not be fulfilling what we need to do for the why of helping learning. Um, so just to come back to that cycle in schools that we've been talking about, I've had a couple of reflections and really this part of the presentation and, and now until the end is absolutely up for, I'd love to talk with you about each of these items and areas. Um, and you know, So feel free to kind of call out or uh, describe one of your own experiences. But so if we start with impetus, which is this idea of understanding and diagnosing your own challenge. Um, what we've been seeing and learning is that many schools will have a go at identifying what their problem is, um, but they do it at the general and not the specific. And that could be about, oh, in a primary school, we're concerned that our, our, our primary maths or our early years maths isn't particularly strong. And they then go about saying, well, how do we address that? But that's not specific enough um, to really get to a program or an approach that will help solve that issue. So people need to, and, and there are ways of getting even more specific with evidence and data in your school to ask the even more specific question, which in a way is a research approach anyway. Anyone that's in, in conducted research knows that it's all about the question. And so understanding your own data, whether that's NAPLAN data or formative assessment data or the test that you're doing in your school, um, right down at the question level can make a big difference to your problem identification. So we've seen some schools and systems bust apart the same um, knowledge test that's occurring in their NAPLAN questions and looked at it over a series of tests with all of the cohorts of kids to understand where the problem is. So to extend that question further or to extend the example further, in, in one of the schools that we've been working with, they've moved beyond where we know we've got a problem with maths in early years in that they started to understand that it was about confidence. They're actually, their levels of achievement were all right, but whenever they were being, the kids were being taken to a level beyond base understanding, they performed very poorly. But they should have been all right given the level of knowledge that they had. It's not they had been, they had received it, but they had low confidence and they weren't trying to go one level higher in their um, answering these NAPLAN questions. So that school actually started to say, we've got a problem with maths confidence. And can you see how that difference in saying we've got a general problem with maths in early years, maybe we should be doing more drill and instruction, versus we've got a problem with math confidence, we're going to work on kids' metacognition, the ways in which they're thinking about their maths problem solving, um, leads you to two very different journeys. So um, really helping schools get confident with their data or with that inquiry process of um, asking what, what is the problem we're really trying to solve is, is, is terribly important. Um, and 
can lead as a whole, whether that's as a, a year level or a subject level or a whole school conversation, it doesn't just need to be about academic performance, it can equally be about behaviour or parental engagement um, or, or whole school culture or even what, how we're going to structure um, our lessons. All of these are really valuable ways of coming into um, the, the problem definition. Just quickly within that, has anyone got any experiences or comments where that's been involved in issues at all? So the next area of awareness. So we've got a website up now. We're kind of one of these guys that we're, we're hoping to be a new network. We're hoping to help share this knowledge and information. Um, but just we see ourselves as supporting the existing networks. So what we know from the research, not just in education but in all fields, is professionals will listen to other professionals in their own field. Teachers will listen to teachers, school leaders will listen to school leaders, um, everybody else is treated with a degree of scepticism because you don't really know. So that's, that's fine. Our theory of change is actually let's spend time helping those networks become more effective. But for you, think about your own networks. Where do you go to get knowledge or ideas as you were thinking about addressing the problem that you were working at in schools. And it's really worth checking your network for a couple of things. So I've got up there dead ends and echo chambers. Many networks can um, only hold information that sits inside their work. So you find that it's not bringing new knowledge to you. It's repeating existing information that may already um, be self-serving. So it's really worth asking that question. The other thing is, and this is happening, you know, we know in society generally, the problem of echo chambers. People are only subscribing to lists or joining conversations or being in conferences with people that, that, that agree with them already. So they can have their own prejudices further validated and further strengthened. And networks can have that, that, that risk. So as someone committed to the best learning opportunities for your children, and for always learning to improve, challenge, having your ideas challenged by new information is particularly important and relevant. So it's worth checking in those networks as you start to think about answering that question, my specific question in my school improvement, that you're not going to sources that um, have limitations or recognise the limitations and look elsewhere. Um, the last next one is about analysis. So. Um, I mean, it's even up on the board here with Research Ed. I know Tom got a, a bit of a hassle on the Saturday event at Research Ed. It's this, what works only gets us so far. Um, the research evidence can only show you what worked somewhere else at another point in time. That doesn't mean it's not relevant. It's very relevant and can be very useful. But what we need to keep asking ourselves, and this is sort of the obligation on the research community, is not just what worked, but what works, for who, under what conditions. And if and, and you should be, uh, as people querying the evidence base, demanding that. Because then that analysis causes you to say, well, when did it work? What were the preconditions for it? Maybe we needed um, to have greater professional capability in our staff before we put this out. Maybe we need more time because it really needs to be delivered every single week for nine weeks, not once a term. I mean, all of these are key questions to helping make sure that you get the benefit of its effect in another environment, in your environment. Because as a school leader, you only care about your own environment and your kids. So that's the really important bit on analysis. Um, adopting and adapting is a, is a key dimension of recognising that to move something into real practice, um, it's going to be about making changes. So we talk a little bit about faithful adoption of the things that are the active ingredients in an approach, but intelligent adaption. It's not going to work like that for us because our parents um, won't engage in um, the mobile devices yet or in a web platform because we've got um, a high degree of digital exclusion. We might be working in tough circumstances. So to then just say, well, we've built the website, why aren't they coming, is never going to be effective. So there has to be good adaptation to the local conditions. Uh, again, we've got a set of resources on Evidence for Learning site that's in this mode about thinking about your implementation planning, um, which has got elements of absorptive capacity, which is a very technical term, but, but what I think about it as the wet sponge. If you've got a you know, body of teachers um, who are already at their maximum 
with the changes that have been brought down either by you as a school team or by the system, um, thinking about adding more activity to that work could just see the water run straight out. It's not going to be absorbed by the sponge anymore. They're at maximum. So this is often about, innovation in this world is often, in this work is often about saying, what are we going to stop doing as much as what we are going to do? And then thinking about if we're going to talk about doing a new thing, is our environment ready for that thing? Can it handle it? Um, and what might, else might come down from that? The last two parts are about really acting with good intent and generating your own local evidence and knowledge um, and measuring and evaluating and creating baselines and again, we've got some good resources on the site to help that conversation. And that's really important so that schools can make a decision whether to omit the work that, that you know, the best, you know, almost the, the second best result is to find out that it didn't work in your school. Because then you can stop it and not do it anymore. That's great, because then you can focus on activities that give you higher learning volume. So just to finish, this is a lesson from um, healthcare, a, a hospital in the US. Um, who have seen the most remarkable growth um, in both hospital admissions and the improvement in clinical outcomes for their patients. And they came from a very low base. Um, and this then is really about a mindset. Thanks for your time. Yeah. So we have a couple of different roles. We um, work with the universities, um, do you mean in terms of teacher education? Sometimes we just let the, the support that already, the teacher education that runs, we try to bring these evidence assets to the initial teacher education so that our synthesised evidence is provided as part of what they're doing in the coursework. And then sometimes we're providing these resources to the faculties for them when they're working with schools to help the schools themselves capture data for them to share and research as well. And then sometimes we um, hire the universities as evaluators of the programs that we were talking about. So a few different ways of having a relationship. Um, so they're approaching us. We, we do. Um, have a couple of schools that have already been engaging with the materials and have said we'd like to work more closely with the material um, and then we're really pleased about that. We've got about five or six schools that we're in that mode with but um, we're, we're, I mean that's good for our learning so that we can test the work and, and do the listing but we don't have an aspiration to build a new alternative network because we think there are lots of really strong networks that exist already. So for example we do work with ACEL we sponsor at their conference and then work out through their network or we work with individual state networks too. But if you're a member of a network or are interested in talking further, we'd love to chat about how we can support your work. That's how we see ourselves operating mostly. Thanks very much.